Good morning. It's such a great morning to see everybody who's out and about with us as we are thinking as in the announcements. There was an announcement about VB, a VBS meeting next Sunday. Uh, just think about your opportunity to serve there. Now, I know there'll, there'll be a handful of people who say, I, I, can't, ha- I can't do anything. I simply don't have anything to give or to offer, and that's not true. That's not true. We all can help. Uh, when given an opportunity, so just you know, keep it in your mind, pray about it, and and uh, we will we'll look forward to a great VBS this summer. When we sit down and think about our lives, how many of us would characterize the days that we live in as going through a spiritual battle? And when you think about warfare, you say that's that's tough. It's really tough to think about someone who's who's out to take your life, and you may be called to take their life, and you'd say. That's just a really hard thing to do, and you're right. But when we think about a spiritual battle, we are engaged with an enemy that we cannot see. And yet he is warring over your soul. And you say, well, how are we going to defeat this guy? I can't see him. He's been around for centuries. He's tricked even the best of us. What kind of hope do I have? And that's a good question. In any good in any good way, in any good plan, in a plan to overcome any enemy, whether it's on a sports team or whether it's spiritual in nature, you you have to first of all, you have to be prepared for that battle. You gotta ta- do what it takes to be prepared for the day that you know it's gonna come and you gotta be ready for it. The second best strategy is form a good defense. Know what you're gonna do before it happens. If you go and ask Anybody who plays on a sports team, how often do you run that play before you run it in a game? I mean, I find it interesting they have things called trick plays. And you know the only people who are not tricked are the people on the offense, right? Or else it wouldn't be a trick play. They ran that more than one time successfully. Maybe not in a game, but over and over and over and when you think about a defense, I mean, if you're really sitting down and looking at that, you know, they, they, you know, if there was no defense, if you just gave up points right and left and never stopped them, well, you'd be hard-pressed to win anything. And so when we think about our spiritual lives, this battle that we're in, we need to be prepared and have a good defense. And when Paul is talking about this in Ephesians chapter 6, notice what he tells them to do in verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. See, notice he's told them twice to be prepared. Put on the armor of God. Now, really think about it. How many of us, if we were going to go to battle, would say, no, I don't think any, I need any armor. We're just going to go out there like we are today. No, that's not going to work. So you've got to be prepared. He's telling them, get ready for a spiritual battle. But then he says that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the trickeries, the schemings of the devil. How, how many times have you sat down and thought about the Bible? You said, well, this is... Is God's, God's plan of salvation. It is. It is, absolutely is. Over and over and over again, it gives examples of those who turned their life to follow God and were successful. But have you ever sat down and thought as you read the, about these people in Scripture and, and about these events in Scripture that God is also telling you how the devil works as well? I mean, really... If we sat down and thought about it, how many good things can you say about David, King David? He said, well, he he fought Goliath, a mighty man of valor. He he wrote all these psalms, and he he writes beautiful words to honor God. Yes, what did he do? Well, he sinned a couple times. How did Satan get him to do that? That's a good question, isn't it? I mean, if we sit down and look at all these mighty men, there are times they have seen, you read about their failures. When you read about the failures, you can sit down and say, ah, that was Satan at work there. How did he do that? What I want to do this morning is I want to 
to pull out three things. This is not the totality of everything that Satan has to throw at you. It's, it's not every single thing. But what I want us to do is think about three things that affect people today, now, in this room even. And if they don't affect the people in this room right now, you're going to run across someone. This is going to impact their lives. And so when we start thinking about these three things, I, I want us to really look at what Satan is selling you and what God really has to say about it. Because a lot of times it's totally different than what Satan is feeding us. So the first thing I want us to think about is despair. Despair. Now, despair is the lack of all hope. It is a lack of any hope, and the world is never going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. That our, our time here is just over and over and over the course of time, the days in, days out, every day we wake up, it's just going to get worse. And you might even say this, or you might even think this, or you may even heard this said, that God is just out to get me. I just can't escape him. He's out to punish me. Well, that's not true. That's not true. And you would sit down and say, well, well, if, if, if that's not the case, then why do I see this everywhere? Because if you're in despair, you're not going to worship a most holy God. I mean, it's really hard to praise the one who you feel is putting you through a really hard time, isn't it? I mean, it really is. I was accused one time when I was teaching. They said, you know, this is stuff they teach in college biology. I said, that's okay. You'll know it when you get there. And I was helping to prepare. But it's like, oh, all in despair. It's all crumbling down. No, you can do this. You can make it. You know, God is not against you. Well, how do you know God is not against me? Well, let's look in the Scriptures. See, the truth is, is God never set up hell in order to hurt anybody. Notice what it says, Matthew 25 and verse 41. In the midst of this parable he's given out, that there, is a, there is a servant, and the servant wasn't doing what his master wanted and in, or in, this, in, this, in this instance here, it's actually the, the great right throne judgment. And the idea is they're not living the way that they ought to live. They wasn't helping those who were hungry or thirsty. And they wasn't taking care of strangers. They wasn't helping people. They're actually being un, very unloving to people. Notice what he says in verse 41. He says, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, did you notice that description? What was hell prepared for? For whom was it prepared for? Well, the devil and his angels. That's who it was prepared for. Why, why is that important? Because it wasn't prepared for you. It wasn't prepared for me. It was never God's intention to send anyone there. Except who? Well, the devil and his angels. Notice if you look in Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation 20 and verse 15, notice what happens. Then death and Hades, this is Revelation 20, 14 and 15, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now notice... Notice that the death and Hades is cast there. We find out that Satan is also going to be cast there. But this is the second death. That's what it's prepared for. But you also have this other group of people that's going to end up there. People is going to end up there, but it wasn't God's desire for them to be there. Their name is not written in the book. If you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, when the angels come back taking vengeance, it's on those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel. You say, well, but why would he do that? Because they're honoring Satan with their lives. See, over and over and over again, God has tells us, oh, tells us that God wants men and women to be saved. That's why Jesus came and suffered and died on the cross. Notice 1 Timothy 2.4. 
in this description about, about God, notice what Timothy has written to him. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Notice if we go to verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now notice, this is what God desires. This is good in His sight. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Notice, He wants all men to be saved, all women, all mankind to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Give me just a second. Now I can breathe. All right, so now he says he wants all people to be saved. He literally says that. I mean, in the conversation, we think about God and heaven and hell and, and eternal destinies. Is it important to know that God wants you to be saved? Well, yes. It wasn't his plan for people to be lost. If you go to John chapter 3 and verse 16, very, very familiar verses, Jesus here is telling Nicodemus this. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have the whoever believes in him. Whoever. Whoever will listen. Whoever will believe. Whoever will follow. Anybody can be saved. You go to 1 John 2, 15 and 17. Because some people say, well, God loves the world this much. But there's things in the world God doesn't love. Lust the eyes, lust the flesh, lust the pride of life. He doesn't love the things of the world. Now when we think about ourselves, we get so wrapped up in this world that we can't see who? We can't see God. We can't think about heaven. Because we're so wrapped up in this world. But God doesn't see those things. He loves you. He loves me. He loves people enough. To send his son so they can have a hope of salvation. Now that's an amazing blessing. He doesn't want, again, anybody to be lost. And Paul writes this again in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. That God, that Jesus is the Savior of all mankind, especially those who believe. Especially them. Well, why? If they don't believe, they can't come to him. But if they believe, they can come to him and be saved. See, God isn't against you. I mean, yes, we're all going to go through some very hard things in this earth. That's a given. There's a lot of hard things here. But it doesn't mean God is against you. It means that you are alive. It means that you can feel and experience. It doesn't mean God is against you. So when Satan is trying to sell you despair like you're giving Tic Tacs or Pez of a Pez dispenser, don't buy that. He's not like that. He's not like that. Deception. Deception. Satan is really good at that. I mean, really think about it. If you go to John chapter 8 and verse 44, you see Jesus saying Satan has lied since the beginning, the beginning of time. That's a long time, isn't it? I mean, you go back and you think about that first temptation. What did the Satan use to deceive Eve? A lie. A lie. You shall not surely die, or you won't. Have you read Genesis 5? I did that one time. They lived so long, and then they died. They had children, they lived so long, and they died. Had children, lived so long, and they died. They died, well, except for Enoch. But everybody else dies. It's a very sad thing to read. It really is. But what did Satan sell her? You'll not die. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He didn't lie about that. Now we know right and wrong. But death is a surety. It's a surety. You know what he likes? He likes to lie to people. And he likes to lie to people. And he likes to have people who are not saved. People who are lost. People who are in their sins right now. He likes them to believe they're saved. That's what he likes to do. He'll tell you it's okay. He'll tell you you have lots of time. He says all you need to be is a good person. That's all you need. 
had a guy one time say, you know, say at the, in the judgment day, the Lord is going to be so busy with all these terrible people like Adolf Hitler and all of them that he won't even have time to look at me and I'll just slip right on in. He believed it. That was his thinking. He thought he had more time than he had. He'll sell that lie every time. But why will he sell that lie to make people who are lost think they're saved? Because they'll get busy working. And they'll work and they'll work and they'll work. And what are they doing? Teaching the same lie over and over and over and over. See, they get busy doing it. Because Satan has deceived them. And they not, may not be able to see the truth. Notice Again, if you're in, the, in John 3, again, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, notice what Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3 and verse 3. He says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I think he's serious here. What are you talking about, Jesus? How does that even happen? Notice what it goes on to say. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Now notice, he tells them there's this new birth of water and the Spirit. Now notice, if we go different places in scripture he'll tell us what that is god will tell us notice colossians chapter 2 verse 11 notice how uh, paul puts it here in him colossians 2 11 you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands a circumcision means these are cutting off by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespass and the uncircumcision of your flesh is made alive together in him, having forgiven all trespasses. See, there was a time when something was cut off. The sins were cut off of the body through the baptism with Christ. That occurred. You're separated from your sins. Now think about that for a second. That's a rebirth. That's a new creation. That's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If you're in him, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We've changed. And in that context, our relationship to God has changed through this baptism. Notice again, 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice what he says here. This is a, an anti-top to the flood. Now the idea is the flood pictures something in the Old Testament that we learn about in the New Testament. It's there in the Old in a particular way. And we're going to make a new application in the New, in the new Testament. Notice what he says. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of the good conscience toward God. Notice, it's not like we're just taking a bath. It's not that we're, we need to have some hygiene taken care of. It's not that. It's an answer of a good conscience toward God. We're doing what God wants us to do. Well, how can you prove that? Well, how can you have a good conscience toward God? If you're living a sinful life that separates you, you'd say, well, you can't. You, you, you can't. If you're living a sinful life and you're ashamed even to pray to him, how, how can we have a good conscience? Well, what did Colossians 2 tell us? Or yeah, 2.11 tell us? It was in baptism those sins were cut away from our heart. They were cut off. We're separated from our sins by our baptism. How do you have a good conscience? Those sins are washed away now. You're clean. You can have that communion with God. You can have those, those things in common now. And it goes on to say, he was gone in, 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Notice again, when we look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Here they found out that they have crucified the Christ. The one that they were looking for, the Savior who came, they crucified. And now they want to know what they do. Notice what Peter says. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, the forgiveness, the sending away. That's how that remission can be translated. Of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And notice he says it to those people in verse 38. They can have their sins forgiven. But not only those people, when you look in verse 47, the Lord's adding to the church daily, those who are being saved. It wasn't just those first 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. But as people hear and obey, they get to be saved. He will trick people who are not saved to think they follow Jesus. It's a very sad state of affairs because they'll get busy and they will work like it's nobody businesses but God's. They will. But then there's doubt. See, that's the other D word, another, the third thing. See, he, he likes to deceive us, he likes to put us in despair. But if he can get you to doubt, oh, he's got you. He's got you. You know, that's the thing about Satan. Not only will he get busy tricking people who are not saved that they're saved, he will tell people, that the, those who are saved, that you're not saved. That you're not good enough. That Jesus cannot forgive that. He'll be as busy doing that as the other one. He'll say, well, why would Satan... Try to get me to think that I'm lost when I'm saved. Because then you'll do nothing. You will do nothing. Well, how does that impact? Well, we got lost people thinking they're saved and they're working. We got saved people thinking they're lost and they're doing nothing. How does that feed into Satan's plan? Oh, it's all in there. Everywhere. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I know enough to do this. Now, there's a good friend of mine, Demar Elam. He, he said one time that evil will circle the globe while the truth is getting her boots on. There are people trying so hard to get prepared, and wickedness is just going rampant. Why? We doubt if we know enough, if we're good enough, if we can do enough. But who are you focused on when we have those ideas? Where does Jesus fit in there? See, that's a good question. See, when you go back to Romans in chapter 6, what Paul does in Romans 6, he discusses a lot of different things. Notice what he says in verse 7. He who has died has been freed from sin. See, that's what Paul says. He who has died has been freed from sin. Do you want freed from sin? Well, yes. So what do you do? Notice what he says in the first six verses. What shall we say then? Shall we continue, continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's a good question. If we died to sin in our baptism, how can we just live that way? Well, we can't. Notice what he says. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. See, whenever we're baptized, we say, I don't know the way other than God's way. The way I'm living leads me further away from God. So if I die to myself and I listen to God and I'm baptized, have those sins washed away, when I come out, I can say I'm living for God now. And it works until we think that we're not. 
But you are. You are. You're God's chosen people. And I, I know it's really hard sometimes to think that we're the saints of God. But we're the saints of God. See, when, he ta- when Peter writes to the saints, he's writing to us. We're God's people. We can't go back and say, God, you know what you're talking about. You know how wicked I am. That old person has died. There's a new life. We have it. We have to live it. We need to be that person that God wants us to be. Notice again, if you look in verse 16, he hits it again. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves yourselves slaves to obey... You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you are slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. God's people. You are God's people. You know enough. Notice you look over Romans chapter 8. Notice what Paul says here. He's in this discussion, and in verse 31 he says, If God is for us, who can be against us? That's that's a good question. Nobody. If God is for us, who can bring a, a charge against God's elect? In verse 33, it's God who justifies. You're on God's side. Notice what he says in 38. For I am persuaded neither life, death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So yes, you may have sinned greatly this week. Yes, you may not have been on the the top of your game this week. Your 100% may have been 60%, but you gave your 60% all you could. What did God expect? He expects you to be faithful and live for Him. See, it's one thing to live a faithful life, which means over the course of your life, you're honoring Him. People know you honor Him. If you sin in one area of your life, you can still get forgiveness. You can still go to heaven because you committed that sin. That one sin isn't too great, more than all of Jesus' blood or the grace that God has. It's not great enough unless you allow it To dictate who you are. See, that's an amazing thought, isn't it? You're called to live faithful. Faithful. It doesn't say perfect, although that's the aim. It doesn't say sinless, although we sin less. That's the aim. We'll We'll be perfected when God comes back. Notice if you turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is describing himself. And notice how he describes himself. Starting in verse 12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You say, that's a lot of good things there, Paul. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent or violently arrogant man, But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Did you ever have a time you want to sit back and say, Paul, I think you missed it. I think I'm the one that really dropped the ball sometimes. But if he can forgive Paul, then he can forgive you. He's the example. And that's what he talks about starting in verse verse 16. As he's a pattern. Why is he a pattern? You can change your life. But once you do that, you don't have to doubt yourself. He remembered his past, but his past didn't control him. You serve God now. And then again, you're at 1 John 1, 7. If you walk in the light, he is in the light. If we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. From all sins. See, when we live that faithful life, we get that continual cleansing. And so if Satan can get us to doubt and not do anything, could you imagine if we said, Satan, I doubt you're telling me the truth. 
and started living it. Satan has all kinds of tools. Satan has been at this game longer than you have. And that's an amazing thought. Even the oldest one in here has not been around as long as Satan has. He's got lots of experience. And he'll try his best to trip us all up if we allow him. Three things. Be watchful for despair. Despair. God is not against you. There is hope. There's a brighter tomorrow. And as sad as it may be, we may not see it until we get to eternity. But that hope is still there. God is not against you. Deception. He will sell you any number of lies. He will sell you so many lies. He'll tell those that are saved, not those who are lost or are saved, and he'll tell the saved that they're lost. Doubt. He'll put it in there. I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I can speak well enough. I don't think I can sing good enough. I don't think I can explain it good enough. I don't know enough. He'll plant that if we allow him. If those things take a hold of us, we'll not be who we're supposed to be. But aren't you glad in Christ that we don't have to listen to that? We're good enough. Why? Jesus allows us to be good enough. His blood covers our sins. So when God sees us, God sees him. He paid the debt for all of our sins. We can go to heaven. Not of our own righteousness, but because of Jesus' righteousness. That's an amazing thought. Today, what is your life like? Is it one that seeks to honor God, or is it one that hopelessly wanders around the world, hoping one day something will happen? You don't have to live like that. You can be found faithful in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're willing to tell people he's the Christ, you're willing to repent, change your ways, put them on baptism, have those sins washed away. Come, come out of that water, you grab a new creation. One wants to honor God. If you've done that, and you've succumbed to self-doubt or fear, thinking you're not good enough, and you'll never be, pray about it. Come to Him. Help him ask Him to help you strong, be stronger. Ask us, we help you. And we can pray for you and pray with you. Or maybe there's another need you have outside of salvation. You can come forward as we sing this song of invitation.